Welcome everybody to uh, this uh, online event, uh, Concentration of Economic and Political Power in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, through Zoom, uh, through the Facebook feed. Uh, my name is Gareth Jones. I'm Professor of Urban Geography and also Director of the LSE Latin America and Caribbean Centre. It's uh, my very great pleasure to uh, chair this event and introduce you in a few moments to our guest speaker, Marcela Menendez uh, from uh, UNDP. And we're also joined with Kirsten Senbruch from the Inequalities Institute at LSE and Jean-Paul Faguet from uh, the International uh, Development Department uh, at the LSE. Uh, a couple of quick housekeeping uh, issues before we get uh, underway. Uh, there is a Twitter hashtag, of course there is, uh, for this event. It's hashtag LSE UNDP. And uh, as should be probably uh, familiar by now, the event is being recorded and will be made available through the, the usual LSE platforms and specifically the Latin America and Caribbean Center and the International Inequalities Institute uh, uh, web pages uh, in a few days or so, technology uh, permitting. Um, it's my great pleasure then to uh, introduce in a little bit more detail uh, our, our main speaker and the two uh, discussants. Uh, Marcela Melendez is uh, Chief Economist uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean at UNDP. She has a PhD in economics from Yale University and describes herself as an applied microeconomist with a strong focus on public policy evaluation and design. And that assessment seems well backed up by uh, her CV and career trajectory. Before joining UNDP in 2019, uh, Marcella was managing uh, partner at Econe Studio, an economics consultancy firm renowned for contributions to public policy debate in Colombia. Between 2010 and 2013, uh, she co-directed the Equity and Social Mobility Mission at the invitation of the Colombian government. And in 2017, she was part of Colombia's expert commission for the review of public expenditure and investment. At UNDP, uh, she leads the production and analytical content to support decision-making uh, in the Latin America Caribbean region. And she's the lead author of the recently launched UNDP Latin America Regional Human Development Report 2021, which is entitled Trapped High Inequality and Low Growth in Latin America and the Caribbean, which will uh, form very much, I think, the basis to uh, our discussion this evening. Uh, following uh, Marcella's presentation, um, we'll have some uh, comments, uh, firstly from uh, Kirsten Sembrug, who's British Academy Global Professor at the International Inequalities Institute of the LSE. Kirsten's research focuses principally on conceptualizing and measuring the quality of employment in developing countries, and extends to Latin American labor markets, social policy, and development po policy uh, more broadly. Currently, she's undertaking a large research project on informal political institutions at the macro, meso, and micro levels in Chile. And her articles have been published in journals, uh, well-known journals such as World Development, Cambridge Journal of Economics, uh, Development and Change, and is author of the book, The Chilean Labor Market, a key understanding to Latin American labor markets. Uh, professor Jean-Paul Faguet is Professor of Political Economy uh, of Development at LSE and Director of the MSC in Development Management. Uh, he is also Chair of the Decentralization Task Force at Columbia University's Initiative for Policy uh, Dialogue. He works at the frontier between economics and political science, and I think that's going to be particularly relevant, of course, for today's uh, topic. And his leading publications uh, have included, Is Decentralization Good for Development? Perspectives from Academics and Policymakers, published by Oxford in 2015, and Decentralization and Popular Democracy, Governance from Below in Bolivia, which was published by Michigan and won the McKenzie Prize for Best Political Science Book uh, in 2012. Uh, without uh, further ado, 
uh, in that case, uh, I will now uh, resist the temptation to talk some more and uh, pass the microphone to uh, Marcella uh, for her presentation uh, on, uh, well, leading author on the trapped high inequality and low growth uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, but talking more specifically today on concentration of economic and political power in Latin America and the Caribbean. Marcella, uh, the microphone is, is yours. Thank you, Garrett. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I hope that this conversation will be an invitation uh, to check out the whole report. I am not going to try even to, to talk about all of it, but I'm going to start by giving you a general idea of uh, the, the way that we have framed the conversation in this report and how it leads to a conversation on concentration of power that we're going to have afterwards. Our regional human development report uh, says that Latin America and the Caribbean is in a double trap of high inequality and low growth. And it argues that these two factors are not independent, that these two phenomena are not independent and that there are common factors that are causing us both uh, to be highly unequal and to grow poorly. These are factors that if we could uh, pr properly address, uh, should uh, move the region in the right direction on both fronts. Of course, the report doesn't pretend to uh, address all of the factors that would fall into this description. It focuses on three that uh, we think are particularly important in, in our region and that could help the region if we focus on them uh, to, to get onto a different path. First, one of, the, of them is the one that we're going to be talking about today, concentration of power. But we also talk ab about violence. Latin America and the Caribbean is the most violent region in the world. And that does uh, um, work. It's one of the subjacent factors of this trap, as we argue. And we look at labor markets and social protection systems that do not work well and that have been set up in a way that are making us a uh, highly unequal or, or at least are not contributing to decrease inequality and uh, are making us uh, persist in a poor productivity dynamics. The report pays careful attention to perceptions of inequality. And the reason to this uh, is because we think perceptions of inequality complete the picture uh, that we are able to, to draw when we look at what we call objective measures, the type of measures that we usually can obtain from surveys and, uh, and censuses. Perceptions of inequality very often are different and do not coincide in a perfect way, way with uh, objective measures. And uh, because of that same reason, they, they complete the, the story. They, they tell a part of the story that we are not uh, seeing uh, perceptions of inequality, perceptions of unfairness, how people perceive themselves along the income distribution contribute to shape, uh, to shaping people, people's attitudes um, about uh, policy, for instance, redistributive policy and about a lot of political issues. We believe perceptions of inequality are more related to social unrest, the social unrest that we have been seeing in the region lately, even more so than, than objective measures. And of course, because the report is a regional report, we don't go into particular into par particularities of each country. We recognize that these uh, interactions land differently depending on a particular context of governance at the country level. Just with that brief introduction, to give you the idea of the narrative that we're trying to pull together. We're really not discovering anything new, but rather we're trying to make connections uh, ab about things that we think are key and should occupy a central uh, part in the, in the conversation about how to move the region forward. Uh, I'm going to now move to tell you first why we think this is, uh, this is important why we should be talking about concentration of economic and political power in Latin America and the Caribbean. A quick motivation. As a quick motivation, uh, I'm going to show you the answers to two questions. Uh, this, this 
are questions that we added uh, to Latino Barometer, uh, a survey that covers 18 Latin American uh, countries and that went to the field on December 2020. A large majority of the Latin American population believe their countries are governed in the interest of a few. The Latin American average is 77%, and there is only one country where uh, there is not a majority uh, having this feeling that, that there is unfairness in the processes by which our, our uh, countries are governed. Uh, it's very curious. It's El Salvador with 46%. But look at the countries that have been out on the streets uh, lately. Look at Chile. Chile usually ranks uh, very high whenever uh, we, uh, we ask about uh, perceptions of unfairness, uh, about the income distribution, about uh, war warranties of basic rights, equality of opportunity, access to services. And this is, as I was saying before, not always necessarily uh, perfectly connected to how Chile ranks by objective measures. When people are asked about who are those uh, few powerful groups that uh, have such uh, uh, great political influence, one quarter of Latin, America's, Latin Americans point at big businesses as the most uh, powerful group. It's very curious that in countries where a big business is chosen as, as the most powerful group. Government is not, it, 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 it's actually very, very completely, uh, pro, almost completely symmetric. Government doesn't exist uh, in, the, in the signaling. And in countries where people think that the government is very strong, in countries where uh, people think that governments are very strong, big businesses are not mentioned at all as a powerful group. The feeling that big business is powerful it's justified when you look at, at, at the giant uh, firms that we have in many of our countries. I'm going to show you pieces of evidence that come from different sources because this is a place like this, this is the challenge that we have when we look at these things. But we, we know from different, like we, we're trying to collect pieces of evidence. And here you see the um, revenues of the top 50 firms in five of the countries of the region. You see that in Chile, uh, the revenues of the top 50 firms represent 70% of GDP. And, and in this small sample, the smallest is Argentina with 20% of GDP represented by the revenues of the top 50 firms. We also know that markets in Latin America are, are characterized by very high levels of market power. This graph that I'm showing you right now, uh, comes out of markups estimated by the locker and it out. And uh, what you see is that uh, the levels of market power that are a current concern in, uh, in the advanced economies in Europe and in the, uh, in the US, uh, where people are talking about paying attention to home markets are becoming more concentrated over time and how that, that is uh, associated with market power. Basically, um, put Europe and the and the rest of the world in a path of convergence to the high levels of market power that Latin America has systematically had in in, in its markets. And so we don't see the increasing trend of market power in Latin America, but we just see very a uh, very high market power and systematically high over time. It is true too that. Uh, the labor share of income, which, which is the mirror image of, uh, of market power, he has not been falling in Latin America, or at least it doesn't fall equally in all countries, but it is also true that it is much lower systematically than it has been in, in the rest of the world. High markups are not a defining feature of any particular development stage. We see that markups in Latin America are high compared to uh, those of other countries with similar development levels measured by GDP per capita or by the Human Development Index. And we know that monopolies, uh, if 
are a very like a, a factor that fall very in a very perfect way in the configuration that I was trying to to present at the beginning. Monopolies contribute to high inequality through uh, high prices, through uh, making markets operate with higher prices than uh, would uh, exist in in a context of uh, higher competition. We there is evidence that they unequally affect the poorer households, uh, particularly uh, when there are monopolies in markets of basic goods, because these higher prices represent a higher uh, share of uh, income for the poor households. And we know that they redistribute income from both consumers and workers towards business owners. This is the channel by which monopolies increase inequality. And we also know that monopolies contribute to decreasing growth and productivity because they uh, hinder innovation and uh, allow firms to forego more efficient technologies. W one thing that is particular and makes the situation even worse in Latin America is that family ownership is very high. So if you have monopoly rents and these rents go to a ownership that is more dispersed, the link between rents and increased inequality is not as direct as if these rents stay in very few hands. In Latin America and the Caribbean, on average, in the sample of countries that we were able to, to look at, 28% of large firms are family owned. And uh, on average, 22% of corporations listed in the stock uh, markets as belonging to individuals, to strategic individuals or to families, uh, are also family owned. Look at Mexico. And also the share of revenues from domestic firms that are uh, family owned among the largest, uh, sorry, the share of revenues from domestic firms among the 50 largest uh, are uh, in many countries largely from family owned uh, large firms. We know that monopoly power and business political power are two sides of the same coin. Monopoly rents translate into political power that is often used to perpetuate a monopoly and uh, to influence policy in, in, other, in other areas. Uh, we argue harming uh, productivity growth and making us more unequal. The channels by, we, by which a uh, business political power materializes are varied uh, from typical lobby activities to uh, families being able to place either people from their own family or people from their businesses in the judiciary, in cabinet positions, in the in the in Congress. Of course, you would argue that there is this tool uh, of, of competition policy and competition institutions that should be able to control monopoly power and that that would be a tool that countries should be able to use. In most of Latin American countries, competition authorities and, and competition laws are either very weak or non-existent. In this, um, this uh, survey that we were able to, these numbers that we were able to, to collect for the report, we see that the country at first best, first best when people uh, are asked about how efficient are anti-monopoly institutions is Chile with a 4.4 over seven, where seven would be extremely effective. Not to mention what happens in the, in the upper end of, these, uh, of this graph. The existence of these type of institutions is not independent from a uh, business political power. One area in which business political power is political, um, especially worrisome uh, with regards to uh, the context of the high inequality low productivity trap that we're looking at is uh, its effect on fiscal policy. This is a graph that probably many of you have seen, but it's worthwhile coming back to it because what it is showing us is that 
Latin American countries, most of, uh, of the Latin American countries are completely unable to change the distribution of income in its pass through taxes and, and transfers. That this is very different to what happens in Europe and very different even to what happens in the, in the US. And here's another way to look at it. This graph shows where, where countries start a, in, in inequality measured by the Gini index. And then the percentage change in the same a, indicator of inequality that they are able to accomplish. So we see that we start at a, at a level similar uh, to, to that of many uh, countries in the advanced world, but we are terribly stingy. We are not uh, able to uh, actually change. And this is because both we are unable to raise enough taxes and we raise them probably in the wrong way without enough progressiveness, but also because we spend little. So it, it, uh, it's a vicious circle. Latin American countries collect less taxes as, as a share of GDP that, than countries with similar development levels. This is the graph showing a human development index on the horizontal axis, but it looks very similar when we use GDP per capita. And a, it is also true that a Latin American countries collect less taxes as, as a share of GDP than countries that have similar inequality levels. So it's not that we're at a particular stage of development or a, at a particular level of inequality that is making us not being able to, to collect enough taxes. There is, a, for, for that same reason, a, the, 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 the state, there, there's the statement that we are uh, trying to make, that there are issues of political economy and of interest groups that are making us uh, shape our fiscal systems the way they are shaped. One particularity of our systems is that they are very bad at collecting direct taxes, both from individuals and from firms. But when they do, they basically uh, place most of the tax burden on uh, firms and not on individuals. It's in contrast to what happens in the, in the rest of the world. And this has behind the interests of business people and their business owners among other economic elites. I've spoken about firms on the upper extreme of the firm size distribution. And I want to bring into the conversation what happens in the other extreme of the firm size distribution, where we have a lot of, a, a large share of workers on self-employment or working in very tiny, uh, low productivity firms, because this is not unrelated to the concentration of power in the region, and I'm going to argue. So we remember this is how income distribution looks in Latin America compared to Europe and the United States. We have two lines for Latin America because one of them comes from uh, WIT, and it has the information from uh, household incomes corrected by tax, uh, tax uh, registries and national account data. They both tell a similar story. Latin, uh, Latin American income distribution is characterized by a longer upper, upper tail than the, the distribution in Europe and in the US. But it is also characterized by a much longer and thicker lower tail. That makes us different. So this is another way to look at it. This graph shows the income of the median individual over the income of the uh, of the average uh, of the average sorry over the average income of each uh, income in the style. It, lo it looks like a new because in the upper part we are um, the the ratio is expressed as the average income of each decile over the median income and in the lower part of the distribution with the opposite ratio. But what I want to point out is that when you look at the upper side, the distance between the income uh, of the, of the uh, richer people and the median individual is very similar in Latin America and in the United States. In contrast, 
it is much higher when you look at the at the lower at the lower end of the of the income distribution. So we basically have a, a bigger problem, uh, and that makes us different uh, from the from the advanced economies and the rest of the world. This is, and I'm going to argue, directly related to the way our productive sector is organized. Here we have a distribution of workers across business sizes, including self-employment. And we see that uh, while well, 32% of workers in Latin America work in firms of more than 10 employees, 79% of workers fall in this category in the United States. And while 18% of workers work in firms of more than 100 employees in Latin America, 56 of workers fall in this category in the US. We have instead a large percentage of workers self-employed employed, or working in very small businesses. I don't even dare to call them firms of one to four uh, workers. Look at Bolivia, for instance. Bolivia has 79% of the working population in these tiny firms uh, or in self-employment. This next slide combines the uh, distribution of workers across different firm sizes and self-employment with the income distribution. And then you see that those that are in the lowest two quintiles of the distribution are much more concentrated in self-employment and or employed on what we're calling micro firms here, firms of less than 10 employees than in the rest of the categories. And that in contrast to what happens in the United States, uh, where most of the people, no matter where they are on the income distribution, are employed on firms that are larger than 10 uh, employees, the, the percentage of, of uh, workers that are able to actually uh, work in these firms that will allow them to increase their productivity through training and by learning and working with others, uh, and that may have a, a lifetime through which they are able to increase their income through increasing their productivity, uh, increases with the income quintile and is very low for the poorest. So it's just part of the of the story and of course uh, we have more informality in self-employment and in the smallest tiny firms ma uh, much lower income uh, in the smaller uh, units and in self-employment and uh, on average less uh, schooling attainment less years of education in the smaller uh, in the smaller uh, size, uh, sizes of business and in self-employment. The story is not that because uh, people are less educated, they end up in this type of small firms. And to show that, here is the, the same story when we control for schooling attainment. So while it is true that people with primary, primary or less, in uh, on average, earn less than people that are more educated, it's always true that people that are able to work in larger firms and not in self-employment are better off, both in terms of their income and in terms of having a better quality uh, employment. Why bring this to a conversation? Low productivity is the underlying factor of worker income and of tiny firm sizes in Latin America and the Caribbean. But it's also part of the story of how our markets are set up with these giant dominant, dominant firms that are able to extract rents that later translate into political, into political power because these low productivity firms can't compete with the more productive large business. And this is a sad story to extend that the largest businesses in Latin America are always more productive than their peers in the local markets but are low productivity compared to their peers of the same size in international markets. A competition in the local markets is not being able to, to contain high market power. So th this is, I think, uh, 
an edge of the conversation that I would like to begin because it brings other sorts of policy solutions when you think about how to contain a concentration of economic power and political power. There are things that we should, of course, be talking about in Latin America and the Caribbean. Many of our countries have nothing similar to a lobby activity regulation, eh, and we are still struggling in terms of how to regulate campaign financing. These are issues that should be on the table and that are directed towards dealing with the upper part of the firm size distribution. We, of course, need to be working on to strengthen our competition policies and competition institutions. And there are a lot of regulations eh, that have been adopted over time and favor private interests eh, and should be identified and eliminated. Eh, and of course, we should be taken, taking part in the conversation in which we are not yet participating of how to tax the super, the super rich. This all speaks to the same conversation that is going on in Europe and in the rest of the world. But the thing that makes us different and that like it should, should give place to a, to a new conversation is the idea that if we are actually able to put in place policies to increase productivity, we will not always or not only be improving uh, economic growth, but through, uh, through them, we should be able to contain market power and reduce inequality in lack. So this is, this is a proposition that I want to throw into the table. Productivity increasing policies will be inequality reducing uh, policies in Latin America and the Caribbean. And maybe we would need to think them differently for those workers that are in the lower end of the business size distribution and in self-employment. So some of those that are wrongly called firms, but rather have a subsistence businesses because they have not been able to find employment in, in, larger, in larger organizations. And we would need to be thinking differently about the mid-range of sizes in the firm size distribution, where we have firms that have been allowed to be larger than what would have been predicted by their underlying productivity, and that should be made uh, more productive in order to be able to contain what goes on in the average stream of the market. I am going to close there and let you react. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella. Um, that's wonderful. I'm just noticing that some questions are coming through, which is also great if people want to uh, add those into the Q&A and we'll pick those up uh, toward the latter part of, of this uh, webinar. Uh, Kirsten, if your uh, bandwidth <laughs> holds up, um, I invite you now to uh, to offer some responses to Marcella's uh, presentation and the wider UNDP report. Uh, yes, thank you, Gareth. Sorry about that. And uh, keep your fingers crossed for me that it holds for these next 10 minutes. Um, thank you, Marcella, for the presentation. I so enjoyed reading the chapter and also the background paper. Um, what I loved is how the uh, how you discussed the uh, political, con political economy of how the institutions and the markets and labour in, in, in in this issue work together and um, sort of come, come together to, to create this uh, trap that you described so well. And I also loved it in particular because it describes everyday life in Latin America, it puts data to it, it puts figures to it. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm a bit biased from my many years of living in Chile where I saw many of these things play out, in particular the, um, uh, the example that you mentioned in the chapter about the price fixing, everything from toilet paper to chickens, um, and, the, and the lack of competition where there are never more than two to three companies that provide any kind of service. Um, so you see this in action and it's very nice to see it in an academic report put so well um, and summed up so well. Now, of course, you, as you mentioned in the report, the big question is, of course, how you address these issues. Um, I know an awful lot more about the left hand lo lo thick end of the distribution of the lower end of the income distribution than I know of the top although I've seen both in action. Um, 
there, there, there are, of course, a number of institutional improvements that can be made. But as you very correctly point out, they depend a lot on enforcement. Um, but the lower end of the scale, it's not just that it's so thick and that it's um, such an issue for inequality in Latin America, but it's also recently fed into many protests in, in the region and has generated a lot of political events. So I think one question I put to you for the discussion is generally how you see this playing out going forwards. Um, I remember the protesters in Chile, for example, specifically incorporating their demands for um, a fairer economy in their manifestos and agendas um, because they were so aware of the fact that prices were fixed at, at every level in, in their lives. And it's very rare for social protesters to, to come out with big placards to put something like this you know, market competition on the agenda, but they did. Um, so that's quite unusual. And of course, the other worrying thing is the backlash. So the minute you start implementing or trying to implement policies that take power and profits away from established economic and political elites, there can be quite a significant backlash. So the other question would be how you see that playing out, you know, these right wing candidates, this polarization that we're seeing in Latin America um, that seems to be gaining ground there as um, well in other countries as well. But in Latin America, it seems to be a particularly explosive combination going forwards. Um, I did want to say, uh, make, make a comment about how we how we think about these things. And as I said, I know more about the lower end of the uh, income distribution scale. Um, th there's a tendency among all of us, both academics, policymakers, people in government, to think along particular silos of public policy without really crossing over between one and the other. So, for example, th this report where you, you mentioned the fact that um, social welfare systems and benefit systems and social protection systems in Latin America don't contribute enough to equalizing the playing field and improving um, income distribution, that policy is very much tied in with labor market policies. But it's very difficult to get governments and politicians to design policies that address both of those issues. So one idea that I've been working on is to, um, to, to give informal workers, the, the informal workers that you show so well, not just the self-employed, but also those workers in the um, micro enterprise sector, to give them a leg up and to get them onto the first rung of the formal <clears throat> of, of the formal economy, because that can really sort of set them on a path, so to speak, for um, developing their business and becoming a little bit more productive. Mo most of the policies that I've seen so far that try to address this are some form of active labor market policy, and they tend to be few and far between and you know, just a drop in the ocean, a small program to help small businesses or to help informal workers become formal, et cetera. But really, um, I've never really seen a systematic connection between a social policy that will support these workers uh, combined with a labor policy that can help them um, advance in the labor market. One such model could be the implementation of earned income tax credits in Latin America, especially in those countries which have you know, relatively strong institutions and can actually implement such programs. So those countries which have already got a lot of experience with managing conditional cash transfers, they should also have the um, institutional capability to implement something more sophisticated. Now, the reason I mentioned earned income tax credits is because we tend to think of themselves, especially uh, of them, especially in developed countries, as a social policy that strengthens the income levels of people at the lower end of the income distribution. But in Latin America, they could also be a labor policy because the minute you offer such a credit to low income workers, they would have to formalize in some shape or form. And one of the big reasons why they're not formalizing at the moment is also if they have the, if they have the income level or if they had the, the, the possibility to um, become more formal, they often don't want to contribute to um, pension systems, which they see as a waste of money and which they don't trust. And the same with um, health insurance, et cetera. And they certainly shy away from taxes. So they see no benefit to formalizing at the moment, the way labor markets are structured and the way social policy systems are structured. So an earned income tax credit that, for example, ties 
the, the contributions that you make to social protection systems with a tax credit that also strengthens income um, is, is a way out of this trap. And then once people have become formalized, then and, and if their business grows, their income will grow and they will grow out of the earned income tax credit, hopefully. But I think this is the kind of policy tool that we need to be thinking of in the Latin American context, both in terms of the um, redistributive possibilities that they have and the social possi um, um, protection possibilities that they have, um, but also <clears throat> in terms of helping um, formalize and develop their businesses. Because what we've seen, the, the, the data that you show in particular on workers in these very, very small sectors is um, very revealing also when you break it down across regions in particular countries. We, region we, we just did some calculations actually last week um, the case was Chile, but you can see very distinct differences between regions. Um, and it turned out that the main factor that produced improvement in one region over another was actually the fact that they managed to incorporate informal workers and small businesses into the formal sector. Um, so that's some data that we could um, show you uh, if, if you were interested. But um, mm -hmm. I think, you yeah, know, just going forwards, establishing these, these formal links is absolutely key. Um, together also with strengthening of the social actors, um, you mentioned quite rightly in the report that the unions in Latin America, as they are operating at the moment, are quite limited, both in terms of their political power, but also I would argue in terms of their sheer capabilities. I mean, they have no capabilities to even analyze the labor market and to understand what's going on with the data. <coughs> Sorry. So that, again, that's a policy area where I've only ever really seen very small programs coming from um, through development aid or through political foundations, uh, but that ne have never been implemented on a larger scale and have never really been supported in particular by international development institutions, which have generally tended to argue towards flexibilizing labor markets further, um, which has exactly the opposite effect because the minute you start flexibilizing labor market legislation, then the formal sector actually also becomes more precarious and this in turn undermines unions. So we're stuck in a vicious circle there. Also in terms of strengthening the political actors um, within the labor market. And that leads me to my uh, last question to you, which is how, how you see um, social actors sort of um, interact with this vicious circle that you describe in the um, political economy. Um, for example, in, in the recent social protests that I've seen that there's been an increasingly strong role from NGOs, from social movements that have really um, not just gone out and protested in the street, but that have developed some sort of institutional capability um, to, to deal with some of these questions on, from a more analytical level. Um, and there should be some potential for that across Latin America. I'm not quite sure how much that is that capacity has become developed in 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 other countries. Um, but yeah, those are my main comments. Um, th there are also some useful just the one last thing. There are some useful examples of strengthening enforcement capability um, that, that I've seen also um, where a combination has been made of spot checks and working with particular industrial sectors to formalize increased productivity um, and, and implement legislation. Um, that could be another avenue for, for thinking, as you, you mentioned this in the report as well. But thank you, I, I really enjoyed the presentation and I really enjoyed reading the documents. Thanks, Kirsten. And um, just for the, for the benefit of, uh... Uh, of, of people on Zoom and Facebook, uh, there are links to the re the full report up on the on the web page, and I believe also on our social media. If if not on our social media yet, then it will be there fairly quickly. Um, I'll pass the microphone to uh, Jean Paul uh, for uh, some comments as well, and then we'll return to Marcella, uh, and then I'll open up to the Q and A. Jean Paul. Great, thank you, Gareth, and thank you, Marcella, for a very very interesting presentation and for sending us the chapter in the background paper. Like Kirsty, I also enjoyed reading it very much. I find this chapter very, very clear and well-written and very analytical about a very big and important topic. Um, in, in my view, this is important, not just for Latin America and the Caribbean, but indeed 
for most of the world, if not all of the world. And I include in that North America, Europe, inequality is, is rising quickly in places like China over the last 25 or 30 years, places like India, big economies with, with, with lots and lots of people who are suffering the ill effects of these sorts of, um, of dynamics. Um, which are tied up between economics and politics. So that if I were going to put my finger on one thing that I particularly like about this report, I, I like a lot, I think there's a lot to like in it. It's um, the connection that you draw between economic inequality and political inequality. Um, as someone who was in graduate school in the 1990s, we, we talked about inequality and then some other people talked about politics and things never really came together. Um, and I think you cannot understand one without understanding the other, and in particular, you can understand what creates economic inequality and what perpetuates it and what leads to dynamic changes up or down in the levels of inequality that people suffer over time without understanding the, the political inequality, the connections between economic power and political power, ultimately. And so I want to broaden up from what you've presented um, in Latin America to, to um, to a, a little bit more broadly to, to look at the broader experience in the world and in particular, the recent consensus that seems to be emerging amongst scholars of inequality, that inequality has a natural tendency to increase over time. You know, it's, it's not the sort of thing that I learned when I was in graduate school was that inequality was, was, was A, kind of hard to explain, and B, it was kind of given due to factors outside our economic models, like culture or history or institutions. And so the US seems to be systematically more unequal than the UK, or which is in turn systematically more unequal than, than, um, than continental European countries. Those sorts of stylized acts are, are kind of true, but they hide a, a deeper truth, which we've realized there's been an outpouring of research on inequality and the drivers of inequality since the, the Great Recession, the, the financial crisis around 2008. Um, and and the, the emerging consensus is that it tends to increase over time for fairly powerful, deep-seated economic and political reasons. Um, on the economic side, the most famous exponent is probably Thomas Piketty in his, his first book, where he describes an empirical regularity that the returns to capital tend to increase more rapidly than the returns to, to labor over time. And this is an empirical regularity. It's not a law of nature. It's not a law of economics. It doesn't need to be that way, but it just tends to be that way. And he shows lots and lots of data to, to back that up. Um, uh, it's an empirical regularity of the way that market economies work. On the political side, you have political scientists like Hacker and Pearson. I think they're one of the, the, the more famous examples analyzing the case of the US about how in effect elites figure out how to game the system. And so to, to explain a little bit more about that, because it may be less well known to this audience, um, beginning in the 70s, you get the establishment of a series of organizations with names like People for Democracy or People for the American Way or the Club for Growth or whatever it is, that are basically fronts for industry, but not just all of industry or all of business, or nor even um, fronts for, let's say, the chemical industry or the automobile industry. They're sometimes fronts for particular companies or even for particular mega-rich individuals who set up things that look like NGOs or think tanks that are basically advocacy and lobbying operations that write the legislation that govern the sectors in which they work. Um, and, and so this, they, the, the, the dynamic they describe is of increasing expertise and increasing power on the parts of elites, even in the US, even in such a sophisticated polity like the US, and, and their ability to suck immense, immense amounts of resources out of the public pot and out of markets and concentrate ever greater wealth in the hands of, of ever fewer uh, smaller groups of people because they're playing the political system which then sets the economic and regulatory rules. Um, I tell you that the, the, the way this operates um, and that the UN, this, this American study, this, this American case I'm describing is sort of an exaggerated case. It's real, but it's, it's maybe an extreme, but something along these lines, um, maybe not, not so dramatic is going on in the UK right now. We see the data in, in recent decades. Um, and inequality has, has skyrocketed in China, for example, over the last couple of generations. So it operates like a noose that's tightening around the body politic. It's gradual, but it seems to be persistent over long periods of time. 
to the question that, that I want to ask Marcel, and this is a very, very um, unfair question. That's because he was going to make a hard question. Yeah, so, so unfair that the, the, the gods of the internet have, uh, have, have denied this final aggression. This is, Jean-Paul, you've disappeared. Well, we may never find out where that was going. Um, Jean-Paul may be back with us, but perhaps in the meantime, um, I can pass the, the microphone back to you, Marcella, just to respond in a few minutes to Kirsten and Jean-Paul's uh, uh, points. And then there are a lot of questions coming through as well. So I'd like to leave 20 minutes or something to, to tackle some of those, 15 minutes to tackle some of those. Okay. Let me start by thanking both of you for your comments, sir and for reading and, and for your insight. There's a lot in what you uh, said, Kirsten, so I'm going to try to address some of it. With regards to um, this a typical or typical for Latin America way of labor organization and its connection with the social unrest that we are seeing, I wanted to show you one of the answers that I find very striking. Uh, in, in the in the survey that we post, we ask people to uh, draw the income distribution in their countries. We basically told them uh, to, to imagine that income in their countries would be equal to 100 units and uh, to uh, say how they thought those 100 units were split between five groups from the poorest to the richest. And what is amazing is that the respond is very close to reality. People in Latin America know how unequal their society is. So here I am showing in dark blue the real distribution in Latin America of income in Latin America in 2019. And then the light blue is the answer of like the, the average answer of Latin Americans. Of course, there is some variation across countries, but basically they overestimate a little bit how rich the, the richer are, and they also overestimate a little bit how the income that goes to the poorest and underestimate uh, the income that goes to the middle. But they're basically drawing correctly income distribution. And what is amazing is the answer uh, in orange when they are asked how they would wish those 100 units to be split among the five groups. So people are, they know how unequal we are, they think that this is unfair, and they think that it should be different. And this is pouring in the streets everywhere. So yeah, I, I think there is a connection and there is, it's probably not the poorest of the poor that we're seeing in the streets, but rather people who had a promise of a future and somehow are not being able to, to accomplish it. You, you connect this, and correctly so, to the way our labor markets are regulated. And you're throwing some ideas as, as to how we could become more formal. I agree with you that one of the most worrisome dimensions of your informality is invisibility, no? the fact that you are invisible to the government. And this, this came uh, very was very evident during the pandemic when uh, you had to come to the rescue of people who lost their income from one day to the next, there was no um, unemployment insurance. And all we had were the social registries that we used to target transfers to the poor. And these social registries vary in quality and scope in our different countries. Now I froze. I don't know if you are still listening to me. Listening to me, yeah, okay. I will unfroze eventually. Uh, and, um, and it, it became very evident that the, the pillar of social insurance doesn't work. I worry, however, when we talk about incentivizing people or workers to become formal. And, and, and the reason is that when you look at how social insurance systems have been set up in, in our countries, most of them exclude large shares of the population from the outset. Independent workers are not supposed to be contributing in many countries to social insurance systems. 
uh, rural workers are not supposed to be contributing or we expect them to contribute on an income base that is non-existent. Like in the case of Colombia, where uh, independent workers are supposed to uh, contribute based on the minimum wage and the system it doesn't uh, look at the reality of labor markets where half of the working population earns earns less than the minimum wage. So in, in, in a sense, we, we have, I guess, a, a, a double challenge. And of course, and, and I agree with your idea of uh, bringing people into the radar of the government through through uh, tax so through negative taxes, I would say. Uh, but we have the challenge of reorganizing and, and rethinking the way we are regulating our social protection systems and our labor markets, because the, the way they are set up, they are incentivizing uh, informality or taxing uh, formality, I would say, and taxing firm growth as they are. These are the issues that are carefully addressed in our chapter five in the report. I hate it that I got stuck in a horrible face on the screen. I don't know if you're <laughs> seeing me. Um, and and uh, we, are, we are arguing in the report that a way out of, uh, out of uh, the, the bad place in which we are, where we have somehow invented parallel non-contributory social insurance systems that are of lower quality. So we serve like the poorest uh, of the workers and their families with a lower quality system that coexists with a better quality contributory system is moving or thinking about how to move towards universal uh, social insurance systems. And of course, we are back to taxation on how to uh, somehow break the restrictions posed by the political economy of taxes in our, in our societies in order to be able to eventually be able to pay for that type of universality in which everyone gets to have the same the same type of protection against the risks that we that we all face. So just to say that that conversation is at the heart of the interest of UNDP, at the heart of our report, we're trying to connect it in the report. That's chapter five uh, in the report. And there are 10 country studies that look carefully at how, because this is this lands differently in the different countries. Now we sort of share distortions, but uh, the, the, I think the only way to think about how to, to get out of the mess is by looking at the particularities in each specific country uh, to, to find specific solutions. You were talking about NGOs and other social actors that have arised. And I, I think that's the result of inequality in political participation, something that we have uh, overspread. Uh, ethnic groups are not recognized as political agents. All of the vulnerable groups, victims in, in places where uh, violence is, is a big issue, which is most of the, of the region, have no political voice. So I think what we're seeing is this, um, I, I was going to say new arrangements, but they are not, not new, but other forms uh, uh, that, that will, I, I think will continue to appear in order to amplify voices that we have not been willing to hear or that we have not been hearing. Jean-Paul, you got silence when you going, were going to give me a hard time. Let me, let me just finish because I was, I was about to finish, but I, it, I think it got cut off at a very awkward moment. So let me finish my question, which was, um, the, the, there is, we do have some idea of how these sorts of this tightening noose of, of gradually increasing economic and political or inequality increasing gradually for economic and political reasons can be reversed. But the answers are things like the, the Second World War, the Great Depression, so war crisis, revolution in China. Chinese inequality used to be extremely high. The revolution fixed that, right? But, you know, at extraordinary cost. So th those are a hell of a set of um, policy recommendations. Um, my, my question is, are there gradualist, non-violent ways that we can, we can reverse these inequalities or keep them from arising in the first place, post-market or pre-market inequalities, you know, i.e. keep the distribution, the, the highly unequal distribution from coming out about in the first place or fixing it once it does. Um, I think for the kinds of policies that can be used to do this, the answers are, are straightforward, albeit difficult to apply elsewhere, but we just look at Nordic countries, we look at Northern European countries that do much better than most countries in, in this sort of way. Um, 
But it begs the question because it seems like you need to fix democracy, the kinds of political dynamics that you that you talk about in this chapter. You need to fix the democracy in order to then be able to fix the state to be able to implement these sorts of policies, which are currently not possible. And you show you just shown us now some graphics that show that the, the inequality is similar, but then government policy is unable to do almost anything about it in most of Latin America. That's not for economic reasons. That's because the actions are, are not permitted to, to be taken forward. The case of Brazil recently, um, which was so hopeful, one of, one of our colleagues at the LSE, Francisco Ferreira, has done some work on this, as have others, um, about how most famously Bolsa Familia, but a whole suite of social policies significantly reduced inequality in Brazil in the early 21st century. And then you got the, 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 the right, the empire struck back as it were, the, the right got back into power and started on making those policies. And now inequality has been, been going up significantly since. Um, so what can we do and, and what sort of examples can we look to for, for attacking the problem that you so ably um, identified without war, revolution or crisis? I think we need to work together with the elites and I, in a way in which we are not expecting or demanding altruism, but rather uh, exactly the opposite. We need the elites to understand, to fully understand that they are hurting themselves badly by not we being willing to pay for development. Someone needs to pay for development and as, soci as societies we need to uh, to co come together and, and I don't think anyone can do that uh, from outside for us. This is something that needs to happen internally in the country. The only good thing that may come from the pandemic is that we were hit so badly that a lot of our fragilities became very evident for everyone. I know it's true that some factions of, of uh, society actually became wealthier during the pandemic but but it was very obvious that we were badly badly set in terms of social protection systems unable to respond in terms of people that from one day to the next lost their uh, completely their income in terms of what we have seen happen to children across the income distribution in the relationship with the education system no how these differences, these staggering differences that, that we have allowed became very evident. And I think everybody's noticing things that we didn't notice before. I don't know if there is a window of opportunity here to bring uh, different groups of society together and, and do this process of reflection that is so necessary. I don't know what the magic would be, but I think uh, the, the route for reform in our countries needs to involve the powerful groups that have been so powerful to do many things they should be powerful enough to get us back in in a in a virtuous track what do you think i don't know i fear that the the direction in which things are going are leading rather to the crisis um and that things will get significantly worse my, my worry is that if these elites are incapable of, of seeing, so I agree completely that, that if, if elites could see their own self-interest and it is in their self-interest, um, then action could be taken. But if, if, if equally or more educated, wealthier elites with more resources at, at their feet in places like the US and UK are nonetheless acting in ways which seriously increase inequality, then what can we expect of elites in Chile and Colombia? Um, I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit desperate about it. But then you start by bringing people together around things that may not uh, represent such a menace. For instance, if you think about increasing productivity, mm. in the long longer term, that means investing in education and training. It's much harder to um, block efforts to increase the quality of education. I am probably sounding very naive, but I, I just think we somehow need to be able to um, prioritize and try to um, push for those things that may come through more, more easily. And then I believe in, it, it's going to sound horrible the way I'm going to say it, but you will fix it for me, but I was thinking international pressure. For instance, when you think about taxing the super rich, this is something that no country is going to be able to do 
completely on their on their own. And there is a conversation, and Latin America is not participating in it. We should be called into that conversation because I think there is like, in a sense, that's the most interesting part of the European Union. No, a lot of things that were were made possible thanks to to this umbrella of coordination and pressure. I would say both. We don't have that. We have never had it, and and I think we would benefit a lot from being more uh, interconnected uh, with peers in the same region and 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 globally in terms of uh, having a pressure to to react uh, in in face of of several of the problems that we have and that are affecting us also globally. I think. So. Thanks, Marcelo. Thanks, uh, Jean-Paul and Kirsten, for your, for your comments. I just want to spend maybe 10 minutes or so looking at the clock um, to pick up a couple of the points from, from the Q&A uh, and, and from other media that are coming through on my desk here. Um, in one respect, you've, you've touched upon perhaps the oldest question here that on the, on the Q&A, uh, where the questioner asks here, makes this comment, political power carries ideological power. What role does the narrative or discourse coming from economic elites in Latin America play in the continuation of inequality through time and what can be done about it? And the gist, I think, of Jean-Paul's uh, comments about elites gaming the system is, is also in partnership with that they also control the discourse around what that system is capable of doing, right? Uh, and, and where the levers are and what po public policy choices are, are to be made. So, but perhaps we're, we are missing something, and perhaps you could come back on that as to, you know, how can uh, influence be made over the public discourse so that it's less influenced by economic elite interests and perhaps by wider voices? The coming together, yes, but how do we get to that, um, I, I guess, is the sort of sub-question. There is a sort of corollary question, which is Maria Paslara's question. Uh, what would be the recommendations for the private sector? OK, you've got them into the public debate in a more pluralistic fashion than their own self in than their own interests uh, appear to sort of uh, articulate. Uh, you know, how would companies contribute to lower inequality and increase productivity? And is there any evidence that it actually works? Um, I'm sort of thinking of B Corps. For example, in Colombia and Chile, have they really had any kind of influence on inequalities, on productivity, uh, etc.? And I'm going to sort of synthesize another kind of question here, which comes from one of your earliest um, uh, slides, which struck me as really interesting and struck some other people by the looks of it, which is about the low multinational penetration in the big firm profile in Latin America, at least for those leading countries that you, you mentioned. And I was thinking of a parallel with South Africa, where in the post-apartheid period, multinationals of a very different hue from the mining companies and so forth during the apartheid period came into South Africa. And one of the impacts of that, that sort of slight proliferation of the, of the uh, big company profile, is that they're hiring practices changed particularly towards gender and of course towards race and you got greater sort of inclusion into the workforce through multinational corporations as opposed to domestic capital corporations to returns to education uh, and other sort of variables I mean, would you ever go so far as to say that there needs to be more multinational corporations as a proportion of large companies in Latin America in order to tackle hiring practices, productivity issues in the round, uh, and certainly in terms of gender and, and, and returns to education. So I'll leave those kind of questions up there first. If we've got some more time, uh, we'll, we'll tackle a couple of others. Marcela. A lot of easy questions. Um, with, with regards to ideology and to the fact that the business elites or economic elites in general have means to amplify their voices and to somehow um, command, I don't know, uh, 
de decide what the topics of the conversation should be or the way the conversation should be going. In, in face of what we have been seeing in terms of polarization and the role played by social media and new means of communication, I am not so sure of that statement in general. Because I think what we are seeing is actually other voices that are becoming amplified, not necessarily the ones that we would wish, but there is a competition of loudness, I would say. Sadly, it's very much on the extremes. So I think a conversation that, that is probably necessary is about the role of the media and, and the way the new forms of media are shaping the way we behave and are sh shaping our minds and our interactions. Um, I don't think, sadly, despite that, that it is amplifying the voices of different groups, I, I don't think it, it is um, yet leading to an, an, a true conversation. We are sort of groups screaming from different sides and not being able yet to, to listen to each other. But, but I think there's something to, to learn from that or to think about that is I don't I don't agree that the conversation in general is only being being managed by one side, not currently in Latin America and the Caribbean. With respect to what firms could could and should do, I would say they should pay taxes. They there is a, this a fall of social responsibility. And it sounds nice, and I some firms do wonderful stuff through their spending on social responsibility. These expenses are usually much less than they would be paying uh, if they if they didn't go through loops to avoid the statutory taxes. And they have, I, I think, a problem, and we can criticize as much as as we want the way our, our tax systems are set up and the fact that taxes don't often. Are, go or are spent as people would wish. When you substitute taxes by expenditure through social responsibility, you um, weaken the capacity of government to actually um, approach things at a large scale. We want to invest in education and each firm has an idea or an interpretation of what that means. And governments often have a, a hard time trying to bring together all these big firms that want, that maybe uh, willingly want to do things uh, for the education sector, uh, to have them do this in an organized, structured way that will actually move, uh, not like the anecdotal little piece of evidence forward, but the country as a whole. I think one thing that, uh, from the way that we organize, and this doesn't only apply to firms, but I think that it's very hurtful is the fact that because we have these parts of our society that are so wealthy, we have been historically able to exclude ourselves when something provided by the public sector doesn't work. So if the schools don't work, the, the richer families send their children to private schools that are comparable to those in the more advanced economies. With regards to firms, when training, uh, public training or public education doesn't work, firms end up using up a part of their, their income to train their workers in-house. And by doing so, they don't demand enough from, from the system. So um, that's just one way uh, through which they could probably uh, contribute to increasing productivity, not only for themselves, but as a whole. If they in, got more involved in and demanded a, a response from, from the training and, and the, education, the education sectors. I am very unsure what to answer about multinationals, because yes, I have seen the effect of multinationals sometimes in terms of being in order to the house, but they are not very different, really, to, to big firms in general. If anything, we now have some global monopolies or global, very concentrated markets in hands of multinationals. So I don't think that's uh, the answer. I don't think that would really contribute to solving anything. I don't know if I answered, if I left anything very important out of my response. No, thank you. You definitely did. And you brought short my 
career as a provocateur um, uh, very, very, very abruptly. Uh, thank you, Marcella. Um, there's still a, a, a cascade of questions coming through that, that also the uh, our helpers behind the scenes are, are trying to address and, and answer. But and, and there's points there about corruption. Uh, there's points about industrial policy. Uh, there's some, some notions about uh, uh, education uh, and taxation and the technocratic turn in Latin America as well. So, so much so that I think at some stage we're going to have to invite you back um, uh, in some uh, in online, virtual or in-person formats um, to, the, to the LSE to continue this uh, conversation. Um, but other than that, I'm afraid the clock has caught up with us. But thank you very much, Marcella. Uh, thank you very much, Kirsten and Jean-Paul, for your uh, comments and interrogations. And uh, just to point out what's already uh, in the chat here on my right is that the recording of this session uh, will be uh, on the websites, on various platforms, as soon as we've done some cleaning, uh, hopefully uh, by early next week. But uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just hope we can continue it in in, uh, in another time, face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, if conditions and allow. So thank you very much. <laughs>